Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 630, 630. December the 9th, 2018, Sunday. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. I appreciate it. Okay, i uh, got some things to talk about today. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into it. And uh, of course, let's uh, first uh, touch base on what's going on in Paris. Saturday, of course, was the day yesterday when the, uh, which would have been week four and the largest <clears throat> excuse me, in the largest protest of all that were planned, and, uh, and uh, of course there were protests not just in Paris, but uh, in six or seven major cities throughout uh, France. So the protests have grown uh, very much larger. Uh, the current facts are that Paris is still in flames on weekend number four. There are four dead. Nearly 500 were arrested t uh, on Saturday. Macron is sitting at 18% in the uh, polls and falling. Um, they have closed uh, primary tourist venues. Shops were ordered to close inside Paris. Uh, of course, there's lots of looting, as you've seen from the previous videos. Lots of looting. People just breaking the windows out of the storefronts and stealing. So lots of lobbying. Many businesses will be destroyed, devastated, probably ruined. Um, you have a lot of windows, of course, as a result of that being boarded up to prevent the people from breaking the windows and looting. So it's uh, you look at downtown Paris and you got storefronts boarded up. It's this is going to present, in addition to all the other bad things going on, the uh, uh, cost, the the cost in terms of losses of economic activity, tourism, and of course the probably millions and millions, hundreds of millions maybe uh, of dollars in damage that are being done and will continue to be done uh, is going to be staggering. And the France not really in a position to deal with that right now. Let's face it, they have a lot of debt. Uh, their economy is growing at somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4 percent. In other words, it's very close to being a shrinking economy. Uh, a lot of problems. A lot of problems. <clears throat> Paris, of course, uh, in a complete lockdown, looks like a shanty town. They deployed 89,000 cops, but we hear that there's many cops uh, who are siding with the yellow jackets or yellow vests because they, uh, they are in that sort of, they're not, you know, high paid individuals. They are m middle class. Uh, so they're bearing the brunt of all these taxes and poor economic conditions, uh, rising cost of housing. They also, many of them have uh, el elderly parents that they try to take care of, uh, whose monthly pensions are uh, below the poverty range. So this, um, this stuff that's going on in France is, is really hitting uh, people in the income brackets exactly where a lot of the police would, would find themselves. So it's not like they're elitist sitting on the other end of the scale uh, like you have with a lot of the uh, upper, upper echelon in Paris. Remember, a lot of these people are coming to Paris from outside of the countryside, outside in the suburbs, uh, coming outside of Paris into Paris uh, to have their protests. Uh, most of the people who live in, in Paris and down around the main city area, these are this is the wealthy people. Um, so this is sort of, I guess, the middle class uh, taking the taking their protest directly to uh, Paris and directly to the elites to make sure they don't <laughs> uh, to make sure they can't miss it. I guess you would say. So one of the best. Uh, reporters covering what's going on in France is, of course, Luke Radowski from We Are Change. Uh, he had been covering it here from the States um, for the last couple of weeks, but he's now in Paris. He was in Paris. I think he got there Friday night. Uh, he started reporting Saturday. He's done a couple man-on-the-street interviews, and there was one interview he did with a man-on-the-street uh, guy in, in Paris, which I think was a really good interview, and I can't remember every single thing from the interview, but essentially what this, uh, this uh, French guy says was, this was. This is not just about the gas tax, or even about just uh, the economy. He says it's it's much bigger than even Macron, even though he's very unpopular. Uh, it's bigger than France. He's talking about this is a movement that's all across the European Union, and even beyond that, he says it's uh, all the way you know across the world. And he says it's a it's a pushback against the establishment and against the uh, failing policies of globalism, which have transferred a lot of wealth to. Uh, the already wealthy uh, and away from middle class and people below the middle class and things and such. So there's, um, at the root of all this is, a lot of it is economics, but it's also, of course, we know uh, the 
uh, EU's policies on the migration. And when people are in these situations and then they see their country being flooded with migrants who are coming in and immediately getting on government services while they themselves uh, do not uh, render enough from these government services that they and their elderly parents can even afford to live. So this is, uh, uh, I think, strikes up a, a lot more uh, um, a lot more angst and a lot more uh, uh, anger uh, at the situation. It's it's almost as if, uh, and it is true, it's not as if, but it is that clearly showing that Macron and the elites like him, and keep in mind, Macron was a uh, investment banker working for a Rothschild bank. So that's his background. And so clearly uh, this just proves that he is what you assume an elitist is. They don't really understand the plight of the common man because they've never been a common man. Uh, Macron was born rich. He is rich. He'll always be rich. He doesn't really understand uh, the policies uh, that he implements and how they affect people in the middle class. So this is the feeling of the average man on the street in France. Uh, he talked about the various groups that are involved in these protests. And he also talked about the fact that 80, uh, that 80% uh, of, the, uh, of, of the citizens of France support the yellow vests. Uh, and he talks about the fact that there are a wide range of people involved in this, in the Yellow Vest, everything from Antifa all the way to groups on the uh, right, in the, what you would call the, the center right or even far right, uh, the populist nationalist movement type thing, uh, the AFD party in Germany type thing. So anyway, he threw a lot of things out there, but he says that this is actually, I think the, one of the most important things he said is that this is, is that the fuel tax in the current situations is what brought this all to a head. But he said this has been building for 40 years. 40 years this has been building. So it's been a slow sort of pressure cooker that's been going on for year after year after year, decade after decade actually. And now it's just all coming to a head. And probably what uh, was most important, another important thing he said, was that he said that this, these protests are not going away, that they will only get larger and more violent. He says that they have made the decision with those in the country, these people protesting, that this is the revolution. That's how he says they look at this. This is their revolution. Whether it was the 68 revolution that uh, brought down de Gaulle or whether it was, you know, the, uh, uh, the French revolution of the uh, early 18th century, which, uh, early 19th century, which brought about the uh, guillotine for uh, King Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette and their cabinet ministers uh, and others uh, in the elite uh, government. So this is how they view it is like revolution number three. And um, he said that they are not going to stop until the Macron, uh, Macron and uh, his government officials, his government is how I believe he worded it, that Macron and his government are gone. So this is what uh, it looks like is going on here is this is not just a couple of weeks of uh, the French getting upset and uh, it'll calm down and things will go back to somewhat normal. That's not what uh, we're learning from the man on the street in France with the interview he did with Luke Radowski. This individual is saying that this is not going to stop uh, until Macron and his government are gone and that they have a change in policy. So that's uh, all very interesting information, but I guess I'm at the same point where I was yesterday when I say, you know, the problem with all this is that there is not just one unified opposition to Macron. You have 13 different appreciable political parties in France. Most of them are on the left. Um, some of the, many of these people who are protesting against Macron and the government policies and things, they agree that they don't like Macron and they don't like the policies, but what they probably do not have any consensus on is what to do uh, after Macron and his government is gone. What kind of a leader are they going to have? And what kind of policies are they going to pursue? I mean, are they looking for a, uh, the f a French a Donald Trump? Are they looking to become part of the populist nationalist uh, rising movement that's uh, going on throughout Europe? Or are they... Uh, wanting to go farther to the left and wanting more uh, welfare uh, and, and more 
uh, wealth redistribution because when you look at some of the statements coming from some of the people that I've seen interviewed in the past week, it's all over the place. There is not a clear consensus of an alternative to what they are protesting now. And that's why I see a major problem here because if you get rid of Macron and his government, but you do not have any type of a consensus that can get any type of a, you know, a governing percentage to be able to come in and make the changes. I mean, if you put a populist nationalist in there, well, all the people on the left, which is probably maybe 20, 30, 40 percent, they're still going to be on the streets. If you bring in someone who's farther to the left than Macron and wants an even greater welfare state, then you have the other 30, 40 percent of people on the right, maybe the sort of Marine Le Pen type uh, people who are not going to be satisfied and they will still be on the street. So the problem I see here in, in trying to resolve all this is that there is no clear unified alternative to what they have. We know what they don't want, but what do they want? And there is no clear consensus. And therein lies the problem that they have in France. But this individual says they, the protests will continue, will continue to grow, get more larger and more violent until the government of Macron and his government are gone. And uh, I'm just not sure what happens when that happens. Yes, it would be great if Macron were gone and his government. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, it'd be great if they would have a populist nationalist or something like that that they could get behind. But I just think there's too many people on the opposite end of that spectrum that whoever comes into power will have no governing authority. There's too many parties, too much division, uh, and, and way too large a gap between them to uh, find any resolution. Um, typically in parliamentary systems, you have to have a governing coalition, which means when you have 13 parties, they may each get 5, 8, 10, 12 percent. You have to have coalitions of these various groups get together and come together to have a majority. This is typically how parliamentary systems work. But the problem is, is that in France, the, the, the controlling majority of these parties that would find common ground are going to be on the left. And that puts you pretty much back at the policies of Macron. They'll get Macron with a different name and more promises that they simply can't not live up to because socialism does not work. But these people are hard ingrained socialist. It's in their blood. It is in their blood. I don't know how this situation gets resolved, but I, I am of a mind to think that this individual who is speaking to Lou Rudowski is correct that they've gone too far to back down and they will continue to have these protests and try to force Macron out. Generally, when your approval rating is 18% or, or lower than 18%, you, you simply cannot govern the country. You cannot run the country. I would be surprised if Macron lasts another two weeks. I really would. I think there'll be a no confidence vote at this point and at some point in the next week or two and he will have to step down. The question is, what replaces Macron and his government? That is the big question that no one seems to be able to answer. The Comey transcripts have been released. And as I stated, we have learned practically nothing new. Um, I didn't read them all. I spent about 20 minutes. Uh, it will probably take me two hours to read through that entire transcript. But I read for about 20 minutes and we just got bored because it's the same questions which get the same type of answers and you really learn nothing new because it's 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 Comey speak and you also have a lot of I can't comment I can't comment on that oh that's classified and then this DOJ lawyer who his name is Mr. Bessie at least that's what he's referred to in the uh, in, in the document I was reading uh, he's I assume Mr. Bessie is this DOJ lawyer and uh, Comey was asked about the uh, meeting with Rodenstein talking about wearing a wire and Comey said I cannot comment on that he, he had a lot of uh, not being able to comment because of the ongoing investigation that would be the Mueller witch hunt which is coming to a conclusion because there's no one else for Mueller to interview 
He's run out of people. There just simply isn't anyone else to interview. And what's going to happen is that Uncle Bob's going to write his report and it's going to say that the Russians tried to interfere in the elections to try to help Trump and hurt Hillary. But he is going to say that they were not able to find conclusive evidence or get witnesses to um, provide the testimony or evidence that there was collusion uh, or a conspiracy between members of the Trump campaign, in which case he'll be passing it on to the Congress so that they can do further investigation, so they can keep it going. But Uncle Bob has simply run out of people to interview and bully and threaten. And now he's facing blowback from uh, the investigation because now he's got Stone and uh, specifically uh, Corsi uh, challenging him. And he's got this other uh, sealed case that's going on with a friend of Stone's who is challenging uh, at the federal level, the federal court uh, district level, the legitimacy of Uncle Bob's uh, appointment as special counsel. So you have a lot of things going on here. But really, Comey's coming back to testify. I don't know why. It's, you're going to get the same treatment. Um, you will not get anything out of Comey until he's facing a grand jury under oath and forced to testify. And if he wants to plead the fifth in front of a grand jury, let him go ahead and do it. Because when you do that, yes, you don't incriminate yourself, but you don't get the chance to clear yourself either. And therefore, you are left to the, uh, uh, to the peril of the evidence that you wouldn't comment on that you're allowing the prosecutor to then put his spin on it to the grand jury uh, to show your guilt. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky situation. But that's where Comey is going to find himself eventually. And he knows it. John Kelly is leaving as Trump's chief of staff. Good. Very, very good. I've never liked Kelly. Never trusted Kelly. Never trusted him from day one. I know he doesn't like Trump. I think that's obvious. Um, so yes, I'm happy that John Kelly is leaving. Hopefully he will not be replaced by a deep stater like him, but I won't hold my breath. We have Lindsey Graham making a statement on Saturday stating that he will get to the bottom of the FISA abuse. He will get to the bottom of the FISA abuse. We'll see. We will be watching very, very closely. It's kind of funny, uh, Trump tweeting Macron, Trump's tweets on Macron, telling Macron, yeah, the Paris Climate Accord is not working out very well. <laughs> so it's kind, of, it's kind of beautiful poetic justice that just two weeks ago, Macron was acting arrogantly, making that speech directed at Donald Trump. Um, about how populism and nationalism are, are not good and uh, this type of thing. And then here we are two weeks later and he's fighting for his political life. Uh, Paris is in flames and uh, he's likely not long for this world. And his approval ratings are sitting at 18% and falling. <laughs> and Trump is riding high. Should have kept his little mouth shut. You won't hear the media reporting this but black unemployment is now at the lowest point in recorded history. The lowest point in recorded history. If that translates into votes, Trump's going to have a big win in 2020. The Republicans in general are too stupid to know how to capitalize on this. So we'll get no help from them. But Trump is smart enough to know how to capitalize this on this. And I expect that uh, in the 2020 campaign, you're going to see Trump focusing a lot more on these urban areas that Republicans have never really focused on before. But I think Trump's going to make some headway there. And uh, I think uh, he could start winning some districts that Republicans normally do not win. We'll be watching that very closely in 2020. The Gateway Pundit is reporting that McCabe opened 
the obstruction case against Trump right after the Comey firing. Stroke and Rodenstein were among those in the meeting when that decision was made. This, of course, was before Mueller was appointed. And then there's another story by Gateway Pundit that goes along with that, which says that Rosenstein appointed the special counsel on the, on the request of Mark Warner. Yes, we know about that. Uh, we never saw the two tied together before. We certainly knew the date and that Mark Warner sent that request, but we've never really heard anyone make the claim that Rodenstein uh, did it, uh, appointed a special counsel because of Mark Warner. I think there were probably other things involved, but certainly that was uh, something that uh, probably had, was a factor. Uh, you'll never get Rodenstein to admit that, of course, but I think that that's a fair uh, assumption. Of course, we know what Mark Warner was involved in. Uh, he was involved, he was trying to get a secret meeting uh, with Christopher Steele using Mr. Waldman as the intermediary, who was also representing Assange and Deripaska at the same time. They were trying to cut a deal with Deripaska. They, in fact, did have a deal with Deripaska. Uh, and it was actually given the thumbs up by uh, the uh, FBI lawyer. Um, but Comey shot it down. And we know all about that. Now, the way this plays out, apparently, is that um, after Comey was fired, Remember, Comey's fired, and a week later, M Mueller is named special counsel. Two days after uh, Comey is fired, uh, McCabe is testifying to Congress, and he's asked if there is, uh, by a Democrat, if there was any attempted obstruction in the investigation by anyone uh, in the Trump administration, and he said no. There was no attempt at anybody trying to obstruct his investigation at that point, which he took over after Comey was fired, and he was acting uh, FBI director. But now we find out that three days after he testified, which is two days before Mueller was brought in, he opened an obstruction case. He opens an obstruction case three days after he tells Congress that there was no obstruction. Trump, of course, tweeting out uh, last night that uh, angry about the fact that Comey wasn't answering questions, said that uh, they should force Comey to answer questions under oath. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about a special counsel. He's talking about a grand jury. That's what he's talking about because he knows that Comey has no respect for congressional committees. He'll go in and lie to them. He'll tell them he can't remember, he can't recall, he can't comment, it's classified, all these other things that he can do to a congressional committee and not have any fear of reprisal um, but a um, uh, retaliation I should say um, but you can't really do that with a special prosecutor and a grand jury because he'll indict your ass for lying uh, at the very least so now we know that Trump is going to and has, in fact, stated that uh, William Barr is going to be his next attorney general. We understand he'll have no problem getting confirmed. Many of us are very unhappy about that. I know I wasn't that happy about it. I'm still not terribly happy about it. Uh, I know a lot of you feel the same way. So, at this point, uh, what what does this mean for the investigation, Spygate investigation moving forward? What can we expect from Barr? What do we think we can expect from Barr? What happens to Whitaker? What happens to Rodenstein? Where does all this go? Where does all this end up? And a lot of people are frustrated, and I understand that. I am frustrated as well. And we all have them days, you know? Sometimes I have them days where I just see no hope. And then other days I kind of shake myself and say, well, wait a minute. It's only been two years, and the whole two years, past two years, Trump's been battling just to defend himself. He's had no help. He's completely defensive. But we all believe that Trump has, some people believe, I should say, that Trump has a plan. To what degree he has a plan, I don't know. Some people think it's the Q plan. Some people think it's Trump's own plan. It could be a plan by White Hats. It could be a plan by who knows. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about any of this. Uh, um, and to say that Trump has a plan, I, I guess he's got a plan. I mean, I would doubt that he just has no plan, that he has 
not thinking about it, that he doesn't have some sort of an idea what he needs to do or what he wants to do. Um, so I just want to kind of di dial in on that a little bit and then take a, a closer dive into Mr. Barr. I laid out his bio uh, yesterday, I think it was, or day before yesterday, I laid out the bio. But I want to go a little deeper into some actual statements he's made. I went back and watched his confirmation hearing, his open opening statement at his confirmation hearing back when he was George Herbert Walker Bush's Attorney General. And it's very interesting the things he said in his opening statement. I want to talk about a little bit of that and also talk about some recent comments he's made to see if we can get maybe a different view of Mr. Barr because he is going to be the Attorney General. He's going to be the guy we're going to be counting on because that's where it has to happen. Now we talked yesterday about the fact that it appears that Trump and Sessions used a third party outside the, the uh, DOJ to look into the Clinton Foundation. And that appears to be bearing fruit and will likely produce indictments for many in the Clinton Foundation, including the Rotten Reverend Clinton, Slick Willie, maybe Chelsea, uh, and uh, anyone on the board of the Clinton Foundation. And I don't know about the people who did the paying, uh, but the people who did the playing are certainly going to be indicted. The payees, I mean, they're just taking advantage of opportunities. They may be embarrassed, but I don't know if they'll be indicted. But the people at the Clinton Foundation that knowingly, uh, and this would include Huma Abedin, was a, was a senior official uh, for Hillary Clinton at the Clinton Foundation. She's the one that made the appointments. And the way it worked is you produce the check. Once we know the check is cleared, you get to talk to Hillary, and you go through Huma to do it. That's why she had that private email server as Tom Fitton and the judge in the case has just made perfectly clear. She is probably also, before she is brought up on indictments for the Clinton Foundation, I think the first indictment she will face is uh, uh, for the FOIA violations. So my thoughts are, at this point, is that I am not losing, I am losing some patience, yes, but I'm not losing my confidence that Trump has every intention of bringing down the deep state. First of all, because it's in his nature. Trump is not the guy that lets you smack him over the head, uh, snatch his wallet, and then run down the street and he doesn't chase after you. And when he catches you, beats the crap out of you and takes his wallet back. That's who Trump is. He's not the guy that lets you mug him and then he walks away. That's just not Trump. Plus, look at these tweets. Yesterday, the tweets on Friday were some of his most blistering tweets to date. Specifically targeting by name, Rodenstein, the Clintons, Uncle Bob, Comey, McCabe, Strzok, the whole nine yards. Why does he continue to tweet day after day after day about the criminals and the crimes they committed against him? Why would he continue to do that if he has no intention of doing anything about it? Certainly he understands that his base is going to be awfully frustrated if two years from now he's, he's running for re-election and he still hasn't done anything about the deep state. It's a big problem. And they will still be going after him. On into a second term. They'll never stop. I, he's got to know that. I just think it's... I have a difficult time believing that he would still be this up in the bit about all this stuff, tweeting about it, and still have no interest whatsoever in pursuing it. It just doesn't make any sense. So that's why I do believe that Trump is trying his best to do this, but I think for him there's a certain way he wants to do it. And I believe for quite some time that he believes that the Mueller investigation must be done before he begins to move on the deep state. For whatever reason, I think he believes that the Mueller investigation has to be done. And that may have to do with the fact that he needs to have a lot of public support behind him when he makes his move. And also because Uncle Bob is essentially safeguarding, protecting the evidence that Trump would need to prove his case. So I think there's a couple things going on. And he needed to get some people in place. Uh, he needed to get his protection in the Senate, which he now has. And he needs to get an attorney general and an assistant or deputy attorney general who will stay the course. So that's why I still have confidence and a certain degree of faith that uh, we just have to stay focused and watch what Trump does because um, I don't think he's letting go of this thing. I really don't. I don't think the deep state has gotten to him or anything like that. 
I think he has every intention of trying to out the criminals and see that they are, you know, uh, indicted for the crimes they committed. I really believe he's solid uh, about that. But I think he's doing it in his own time, in his own way, and I think that's the reason he keeps tweeting is because he doesn't want all of us to forget. He wants to remind us every day of the deep state coup. And why would he want to do that if he had no intentions of doing something about it? It just doesn't make sense. It's not Trump. It's not Trump. So that's why I have a certain degree of faith and confidence uh, and why I'll continue to follow this story the way I have for a very long time now. Over two years. Yeah. Coming up, yeah, over two years. Coming up on two years. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about a little bit with the five minutes I have left here. Let's talk about some of the things that William Barr said back in his opening statement when he was appointed Attorney General by George Herbert Walker Bush. Here is some statements he made. He said that upholding the rule of law is supremely important to him. This is what he's saying in his opening speech to the Congress. To him, upholding the rule of law, very important. He believes that there should be impartial administration of justice. It should be applied equally and fairly. He, should, he said it should be above and away from politics. He said that there cannot be political interference in carrying out the rule of law. He said that the Attorney General, he, that he would be accountable to the President and the citizen, citizens. And that after his term is over, he wanted to be remembered as an Attorney General who upheld the law. <clears throat> now here are some recent, th those are important statements because my perspective on this is I don't expect Trump can uh, get confirmed a total hardcore Trump supporting type attorney general like a Rudy Giuliani or a Mr. Whitaker or any of these other type things. You got to get them confirmed. That's going to be hard to do if they have a clear perceived bias uh, in his favor or something like that. It's hard to get someone who has a clear perceived bias appointed because they're supposed to be, uh, you know, not political. So I think that's maybe why he made the decision for Barr. But I'm not asking for a total political hack. What I'm asking for is just an honest attorney general who will uphold the law equally and fairly, equal justice under the law. And if you look at the opening statement from Mr. Barr, back when he was appointed attorney general before, that's exactly what he says he's all about. Upholding the rule of law, equal justice under the law. If that is his standard, then these crimes will be prosecuted. The evidence is there. We know what happened. He knows what happened. All I'm asking for is equal justice under the law, Mr. Barr. And you said that's what you stand for. Here are some quotes from Mr. Barr. He said that there needs to be more Clinton probes. He's talking about the Clinton Foundation. He said that Uranium One is more worthy of an investigation than Trump collusion. Mr. Barr said that Comey's firing was legal and justified. Mr. Barr said that Mueller's team are far too left-leaning. And Mr. Barr said, it's okay for presidents to request specific investigations. If Mr. Barr applies justice equally, and if Mr. Barr really believes the things that we've just heard him say, then the investigation should move forward and the criminals should be brought to justice. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow. You guys have a good night. Goodbye.